Hello, welcome everyone. This is uh, week eight, Trinity term 2021 of the Oxford Philosophy of Physics seminar. Uh, it's my very great pleasure this week to welcome Tim Maudlin, Professor of Philosophy at New York University. Uh, well, what can I say? Tim has worked on a vast variety of topics in the foundations of physics, philosophy of science, metaphysics, logic. Um, among other awards, uh, was the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2008, uh, by the way, given to those who have demonstrated, to quote them, exceptional capacity for productive scholarship or exceptional creative ability in the arts. Uh, since 2015, uh, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the founder and director of the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. Uh, Tim is the author of, I think, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, six books. Um, uh, I think it's seven, but maybe... Ah, seven. Oh, well, I've missed one out. Okay. Maybe, okay. I'm, maybe I'm counting one that I'm still working on. I'm sorry. Well, let me say on a, on a wide variety of topics in the philosophy of physics and logic, uh, the most recent one, I think, is volume two of your philosophy of physics yep. uh, series uh, on quantum theory. And uh, most recent papers, uh, a modal free lunch in foundations of physics about the semantics of uh, physical modality and on the status of conservation laws in physics um, with uh, Elias O'Connor and Daniel uh, Sudarsky in uh, studies in the history and philosophy of modern physics. Tim is also a very active public philosopher, a number of popular articles in Scientific American, Quantum Magazine at the Atlantic. But today, uh, Tim will be speaking on the topic of the PBR theorem, quantum state realism and statistical independence. So welcome, Tim. No, oh, thank you, Adam. Um, so let me, I mean, I, as I understand, it's the, it, it's the very end of term uh, in Oxford. And when I was in school, you know, right at the end of, the, right at the end of term, um, it was thought it's kind of too late to do anything serious. So, you know, you had kind of parties and stuff. So um, maybe, maybe you should take this in, in that spirit. Let me just say a word about, about how this came about. Um, actually, I was teaching a class and uh, quantum theory and and wanted to present really for the first time to a class the PBR theorem and was thinking about how to get the point across. Uh, and then when I was done, I it, it sort of occurred to me that there were various parallels to Bell's theorem, uh, which I'm going to talk about. And 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 so I hope in a way. You know, in an ideal world, at the end of this, everybody will just nod and say, "Yeah, we knew that." Okay, um, you know, you haven't told us anything new, which would be great, right? I'd be very happy if that was the actual response. Um, and and maybe I'm a little worried that it might not be, uh, and then we can have a discussion about that. And 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 we you guys go to the pub. Okay, um, so let me share the screen and just start. This did work before, okay. Right. So uh, now I have to figure out how to how to change it because that doesn't work. Great. I thought it would be I thought it would be easy. Now I have to figure out. There we go. Okay. Um, so if, if I, I'm old enough to actually be able to do this, maybe many of you are not, uh, and you, you can regard some of this as, as ancient history. But if you live through it, um, the entire history of Bell's uh, the way it came to people's attention and then got reported and then got responded to um, and conclusions drawn from it is extremely, in retrospect, kind of worrying. Uh, and, and probably if you didn't live through it, you, you might be a little surprised at what it was all like. Um, in particular, as I say, well, let me see. So can you, uh, all right, this isn't working. I thought it was, but all right, that's life. Um, if you asked physicists, just regular folks sometimes who turn about it, what, what Bell said or what the implication of it was, 
uh, you got a wildly divergent accounts of how important the theorem was and what it did. And, and among the really worrisome, in, in retrospect, I think, uh, strands was a bunch of people saying it was really quite an uninteresting theorem. Um, all it did, in fact, was rule out approaches to quantum theory that nobody was pursuing anyway, right? So it was just a kind of, you know, there, there was a, a, a bunch of people who said, well, this is just the final nail in the coffin of determinism, for example, or this is the final nail in the coffin of hidden variables theories. And those fools who've been trying to do that should just give it up now. Now, I hope, you know, everybody knows that's absolutely 100% the wrong thing to take out of that theorem. Um, and I'm really just saying this for, for, for purely sociological reasons to kind of warm up the idea that there can be fairly strong disputes about the significance of even not very complicated theorems. Um, Tim, so, so sorry to uh, butt in, um, but your audio is sometimes a bit choppy. Um, and so I, we wonder if um, maybe if you turned your video off as much as we'd like to see your face. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. Let me, that's okay. I just have to figure out how to do that. I need to go back here, I guess. Um, now I'm in screen sharing. I'm not sure where I get the get get to the. All right. Let me. Uh, oh, here we go. Stop video. Okay. Um, does that is that any better? Okay, good. Um, and, and so there's the kind of ancient history of Bell's theorem. And then even up to today, there's still disputes about what the theorem shows that I personally find rather worrying. Um, and, and some of those even contemporary issues turn around a statistical independence assumption that Bell makes and that he talked about in later papers uh, and people thinking, well, if there's this assumption, one way to get out of the conclusion, the normal conclusion is to deny the statistical independence assumption. And really the same thing happens with the PBR theorem. So there's gonna be some of this that just transfers over, I think, without any change. Um, now let me go back again and see, okay. Uh, now, in, in terms of Bell, the other thing to notice is that, again, if you didn't live through it, you may not realize this, but as time went on, the presentations of it became cleaner and cleaner. Um, examples were given or, uh, and made very concrete. David Merman did a pretty, good, a, a, a pretty good job of that. And then eventually you got the Greenberger Horn Zeilinger example, which took all the probabilistic considerations out, which was really nice. Um, when I first learned about Bell's theorem, and again, this will this will date me, and some people I think will have exactly the same experience. It was it was uh, Bernard Despenas' 1979 Scientific American article, um, and I still I have roommates who remember when I read that article because they were they were walking outside and looked in through the window into our room and saw me pacing. Um, holding this magazine, just pacing around and around and around with this horribly concerned look on my face. Um, and, you know, I'll never forget that just, just reading through that article. And there was certainly enough in that article, a presentation of what the theorem was, that you could see the point. But if you go back and look at it, it also had some really worrying and I think uh, counterproductive parts to it. Um, and in particular, there was this diagram I've got here, um, which accompanied Despenas' article. And you'll see the way he has it set up that at the top, he says, well, there are three fundamental assumptions that go into this theorem, realism, induction, and separability. Um, oddly enough, locality isn't even on the list, right? Uh, and you know, induction, you're going like, huh? Uh, and, and then he says, well, if you, you know, from those assumptions, you get local realistic theories. And again, you have the word real, realism and realistic floating around in this thing, uh, which is supposed to imply the, the, the inequality and quantum mechanics 
says the inequality can be violated and then you get to experimental tests. And then if you're reading this, then yeah, you say, gosh, I guess I either have to give up realism and you might stop and wonder what the hell would that mean? Um, maybe I have to give up induction and then you sort of think, well, so much for science, right? I mean, and I think there's a, there's a parallel here, right? What would it be like to say, I'm going to continue the scientific enterprise, but give up on induction uh, or give up on separability? Now, again, in, in retrospect, this thing is just completely wrong in every respect because you can have uh, what anybody would call realistic theories where induction is perfectly fine and everything is separable and it violates Bell's inequality because you have tachyons or something like that. Um, so, you know, at, at some level, it was a, 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 an important article, but at another level, it, it was already an indication of a lot of confusion about both what the suppositions of the theorem were and, and what might reasonably be, be concluded from the theorem. Um, and, and I think that there are some indications that there's a little bit of, of that going on now surrounding the PBR theorem. Um, I think and have more or less devoted a big chunk of my career to arguing that the only reasonable response to the observed violations of Bell's inequality for experiments done at space-like separation is to admit uh, some kind of what we could call Bell non-locality. I mean, we don't need to go into the exact definition, but we all have some idea there. But the idea is, yeah, that shows the world is in some sense non-local. There's some non-local physics. Uh, and I think in a parallel fashion that the only reasonable response to the PBR result uh, assuming, of course, that the quantum mechanical predictions are accurate, because this has an empirical piece to it, uh, is that you have to admit what I would say the real existence of a physical quantum state of individual systems. I'll try and explain a little bit about precisely what I mean there, because that could be taken probably in different ways. So that's going to be what I'm going to be arguing at a larger level. The other part of this presentation is just a presentation of the theorem, um, partially in a hope that, again, if you, if you just have different kind of presentations pedagogically, they highlight different things. And I think some of this is at least slightly novel in terms of setting it up. And so I hope people will find it you know, amusing, if nothing else. Good. Um, now, about about saying, why do I, why should I be worried that the same thing is happening again? I'm going to give you a tiny bit of actual evidence of this. Um, I did not go into a large literature review, and I didn't want to track down particular people and particular quotes, but I think I, I'm not just making up that there's, there might be some worrying issues here. So I wanted to start with some, what I think are nice quotes, right? Good quotes, correct quotes. Um, and, and this, First ones, these are supposed to be coming up seriatim, but somehow when I shared this, that all of that didn't work, um, was in a Nature article that came out quite soon after the theorem was published and quantum theorem shakes foundations. Okay, so that really suggests this is a very important result. Uh, the title does. And so there are these two quotes that I think are just, you know, are great. One is Valentini, right? Um, I don't like to sound hyperbolic, but I think the word seismic is likely to apply to this paper. And then it says Valentini believes the result may be the most important general theorem relating to the foundations of quantum mechanics since Bell's theorem. And then David Wallace says something, you know, really quite similar, that it was the, the most important result in the foundations of quantum mechanics he's seen in his 15 year professional career. Uh, and it says at the end, this strips away obscurity and shows you you can't have an interpretation of a quantum state as probabilistic, all right? So that's one strain of, of, of reaction, which I completely agree with. Uh, but not all the reactions were quite of that form. Uh, here's a kind of worrying quote from a blog of Matt Liefer. Um, and he says, the question is whether a scientific realist can interpret the quantum state as an epistemic state, state of knowledge, or whether it must be an ontic state, state of reality. 
It seems to show that only the ontic interpretation is viable, but in my view, this is a bit too quick on careful analysis it does not really rule out any of the positions that are advocated by contemporary researchers in quantum foundations. Now, it, it is a little bit hard to reconcile the sentiment that this is a seismic result that will shake the field of quantum foundations from the thing that it doesn't actually touch any proposal that's being defended um, by anybody doing foundations of quantum theory. So you just, I, I really think it's very hard to, uh, to think that Valentini and Wallace were right, and then also say, yeah, but 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 Liefer's got a point too, right? I mean, I think we really do have to come to a decision here. Uh, and and Liefer says a little more. This is again, I, I don't want to. I mean, I say this later. I don't want to go after him in particular. This is, I think, the first thing he wrote about it, and then he wrote some other things about it on his blog, and, and he changed his mind a little bit about it in this. But I just want to go from this original. These are just quotes from the original thing. This is a little long, um, maybe I shouldn't read it, but he says, if we just start in the middle, there are three possible answers to this question, right? Namely, uh, what is the status of this quantum state? One, wave functions are epistemic and there's some underlying ontic state. Quantum mechanics is the statistical theory of these ontic states in analogy with Louisville mechanics, all right? Two, wave functions are epistemic, but there is no deeper underlying reality. Three, wave functions are ontic. Uh, there may also be additional degrees of freedom, which is an important distinction, but not relevant to the present discussion. And then he, he, he says one and two together are psi epistemic and three is psi ontic. And then he goes on to say, well, look, all the theorem really rules out is one, but not two. So you can still be a psi epistemicist. And you know, I just really have to say, Someone says wave functions are epistemic and there is no deeper underlying reality. I literally have no idea what's being claimed there. I mean, I, I don't understand. I, I just I, I just honestly have no idea what, what it could mean to say, gee, I'm interested in physics, but essentially, you know, there is no physical reality. I mean, I've, I've sometimes jokingly said people say uh, there is no phys physical reality, but thank God it's global. But this really seems pretty close to that. I don't know what it means. To say there is no deeper, re there is no physical reality. Physics doesn't have a subject matter. I, you know, I literally have no idea what's being said. Um, and if we go on, and he, um, if we, if we, he goes on under two, this supposedly thing which isn't touched by PBR, that's not psion, but isn't touched by PBR, he puts Copenhagen. And then he has this supposed quote, we all know Age Peterson said that Bohr said this, but Bohr never actually wrote it anywhere. And there's no direct record of him saying it, that there is no quantum world. Um, and then, you know, it, it's wrong to think the task of physics is to find out how nature is. Uh, you know, I, I guess we need a new name for the discipline which is interested in how nature is. Um, since phusis means nature, physics sort of seems like a natural name for that subject matter. Um, and, and then he goes on to say that it also doesn't touch, you know, cubism, it doesn't touch information theoretic approaches, and so on. And I guess I just, I just think that's incorrect. Right. So, so if you want a kind of hard cash value to the end of this, is is that I'm I'm going to argue no. There are people, uh, and the QBists are among them, who have put forward an account of things which this theorem rules out um, under any reasonable any reasonable response to it. There are always unreasonable responses. Uh, good. So there is a bit at, at, at issue here. Um, again, I don't want to particularly, I put up the quote from Leifert just because I find it and I knew about it, I'd read it before. I don't want to focus on him. I don't want to focus on actually any particular person. I really want to focus on the, uh, on the theorem itself. And uh, as I say, I think, I think it refutes QBism you know, for all practical purposes. Refutes is a subtle term. And if you mean logically, sometimes people raise the level of what it has to be so high that no, nothing refutes anything. Um, 
but for all practical purposes, it sort of kills a line of thought that people had. Um, good. So that's this sort of framing story, right? This is a, a kind of story within a story presentation. And then this is the, the beginning of the actual presentation of the theorem as I gave it to the students. And now I'm not gonna, I hope, say anything terribly controversial, but i will just go through the theorem. So as we all know, um, it, was, it was first published on the archive in 2011 and, and discovered Matthew Pusey, Jonathan Barrett, and Terry Rudolph. And then there are um, various later, more detailed papers and so on. I'm just gonna go through the simplest example. I, I, it, it needs to get, as we all know, it needs to get fancied up a little to extend the result, but I think just seeing how the basic thing goes that the fancying up is pretty straightforward. Um, and I wanna start with a parable just to explain what's at issue. Uh, the parable of the candy factory, all right? Why this is what popped into my head, I can't tell you, um, but this is what popped into my head. So there's a candy factory and there are two uh, gumball production machines, machine A and machine B, and every time a gumball is produced, it comes out of the machine and is stuck in a box and it's marked with either an A or a B as an indication of which machine produced it. And it's then a, a plain historical fact, you can say a physical fact if you like, I don't really care about actually which machine each gumball came out of. And, but the machines are quite different, machine A is a really nicely made gumball machine and all but 0.1% of the gumballs it produces are perfectly spherical. Um, the other 0.1% are misshapen in various ways. And machine B is, is, is a crummy machine and just the opposite, 99.9% .9 of the gumballs it produces are misshapen and only 0.1% are perfectly spherical. And therefore, if you just had two boxes of gumballs and you knew that one was produced by machine A and the other was produced by machine B, but somebody forgot to label the box, it would be easy enough to figure out which box came out of which machine, right? For all practical purposes, you just wouldn't think about it. You just look in and you'd see almost all of the ones in one box are spherical and a bunch of, you know, most of the ones in the other box are oddly shaped. Um, So that's the situation. And, and, and so the, the sort of at a statistical level, you might say it's gonna be quite trivial to distinguish which kind, if you will, which kind of, uh, of gumball you have in, if you have a large number to look at. But there is a sense, I, I take it, an obvious sense that being in a box marked A and being in a box mark B doesn't actually reflect any particular physical feature of an individual gumball, right? Um, there is no physical feature. I mean, there's this historical feature, but there's no, nothing we would normally regard as a physical feature that distinguishes the A, A marked ones from the B marked ones. Um, why? Well, all you have to notice is that I said, and it really didn't, you know, so this didn't matter, is that both out of both machines are capable of producing and sometimes do produce perfectly spherical gumballs. And for all intents and purposes, those are physically identical, right? Qualitatively physically identical. And there is no real physical difference between them. There is this historical difference, but not what we would normally call a physical difference between them. Um, in that sense, being marked A or being marked B does not correspond to or indicate or represent any real contemporaneous physical feature of an individual gumball, right? Um, the markings A and B do not represent physical features, even though statistically a large collection of A's can really reliably distinguish observationally from a large collection of B's. Right, so that's the parable of the gumball factory. 
And it's perfectly clear what's going on. And now we want to just have an exact analogy here. And you say, all right, just as you can make gumballs, you can prepare electrons. Um, and there are preparation procedures that we call preparing it Z spin up. Uh, there's a different procedure we call preparing it X spin up, right? And, and once again, if you had whole beams of these things coming out, like having a big, huge box full of gumballs, if you had beams of these coming out and you said, well, I wonder if this is a beam, you know, it's either a beam of X up prepared electrons or Z, X or Z up prepared electrons. It would be kind of trivial with a little bit of experimentation to figure out which it was. You just run the thing through a stern garrock apparatus oriented in, in, uh, in say the Z direction. And if, it, if, there's, if it's the Z up preparation, the entire beam will be deflected up. And if it's the X up preparation, the beam will pretty much 50-50 split. Right now, again, you you know, one could get really picky here and say, well, you know, even if they all go up, it still could be the X up prepared beam, and it was just a really weird run of bad luck. Um, there's some chance that even though they were all X X up prepared, they all deflected up, and we can calculate the chance, right, one over two to the n. But this is just kind of silly, right? From a from from any normal practical physical point of view, you would just be considered a little bit lunatic in the situation I gave you if you said, well, I'm really not sure how these things were prepared. Okay, so that's you know the analog to looking in a big box that you know either came out of machine A or machine B and figuring out which machine it came out of. You can do that perfectly reliably. Um, And there's another fact, another kind of interesting fact, which is that if I give you a single electron and I tell you it was either prepared in the Z up way, up way um, there is absolutely no experiment you can do to determine with certainty which, which way it was prepared. Um, you know, the best you could do is, for example, check the Z spin, because if it goes down, then that'll settle the issue. But if it goes up, it doesn't settle the issue at all, right? It, 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 you might think it's somewhat more likely to have been prepared Z up than X up, but, not the, but the likelihood isn't that great. Um, and again, I'm just in order to explain this to the students, not really for this audience, you know, I mentioned that X up is a, equal superposition of Z up and Z down. So intuitively kind of back of the envelope, you'd say X up has a 50% chance of behaving as if it were a Z up. So um, if, it's, if, if the electrons deflected up by the Z oriented magnet, that's certainly very consistent, not merely you know, logically consistent, but perfectly uh, a perfectly reasonable thing for an X up electron to do. So there's absolutely nothing you can do given just a single electron to distinguish whether it was as it were prepared X up or prepared Z up. And, and that is suggestive, right? That's a bit worrisome. Um, and it obviously would have all kinds of very important consequences if you could reliably distinguish. Um, but that also is suggestive that maybe the situation is like with the gumballs, right? Maybe the reason there is no test that can absolutely reliably distinguish these two is that sometimes there is absolutely no difference between an X up prepared electron and a Z up prepared electron, just as sometimes there is absolutely no physical difference between a gumball that comes out of machine A and a gumball that comes out of machine B, right? If they both produce sometimes perfectly round gumballs, then it's no surprise that there is no surefire test that you can run on a gumball to figure out which machine it came out of, okay? So it's a, it's a natural thought to have and to think that this labeling by, Z, by the preparation procedure Z up and X up is really just like labeling by which machine it came out of. Uh, it, it may have some statistical significance for large groups of them, but it may have absolutely no physical significance for individuals. Okay, 
So that now we're at the main question, right? We, we now invite the question whether in fact there is any physical feature at all that distinguishes Z up particles from X up particles. In other words, although there's a method to tag individual particles with the words Z up and X up, depending on how they were prepared, it's not obvious whether these tags really correspond to any physical difference between individual particles, right? Uh, and, and, and the inability to, to distinguish them might even suggest to you, it seems unlikely, uh, in exact analogy to the gumballs. And I take it that is the question that's being addressed by the PBR theorem and answered, I think, by that theorem. Okay. Um, so if we just carry out the gumball analogy, you say, suppose many individual particles are produced by the usual Z up preparation technique and put in boxes labeled Z up. And those boxes are put in a storage closet labeled Z up. And similarly, many electrons are prepared in the X up way, put in boxes labeled X up and put in a closet labeled X up, just as we did with the gumballs coming out of machine A and machine B. Um, Obviously, we have no guarantee that all the particles in, in a given closet are physically exactly like each other. And that's not even the question we're asking, right? We're not asking, are all the particles in closet Z up physically identical to one another? We're asking, do all the particles in closet Z up have a physical difference as individual particles from all the particles in the closet X up, right? That's what we want to know. Is there a physical and not merely a historical respect in which every single Z up electron differs from every single X up electron? Now, you know, you asked, it seems, I think that's a clear question. I, I don't see any real ambiguity in it. Uh, and you, it's not at all obvious how we might think there would be a way to answer that question, certainly experimentally, right? One, one might think, how, how, how is that the kind of question? As, given, of course, if you had a surefire way to sort the X up from the Z up, you might say, oh, well, there must be a physical difference between them because look, I can reliably sort them. Um, but we, we're granting we don't have that. Uh, and, and so it's certainly not at all obvious that this is something that you could appeal to any empirical test or any empirical, any empirical behavior to settle. Uh, okay, but I claim under a, a very mild and methodologically unobjectionable assumption, uh, this is what the theorem proves, right? It proves that if the predictions of quantum, the quantum recipe, if the way we use quantum theory to make predictions is good and the correct predictions are right, then in fact, every single X electron must be physically different from every single Z up electron, right? So we can actually settle this thing. And the proof is by reductive. So again, you can kind of see the analogies to Bell. I mean, they're funny little analogies to Bell. You again say, uh, Bell is going to make an assumption, a kind of locality assumption and draw some consequences from it. And that will lead to some empirical restraints. And then gee, at, you know, quantum mechanics predicts and more importantly, nature actually uh, uh, violates these constraints. And then that shows that the fundamental assumption you used had to be wrong. I think you're, you're doing exactly the same thing here. Um, I guess I know, you know, it's sort of interesting if you think about the, the, the Bell and, and, and PBR are a little bit inverse, right? As we'll see, because Bell sort of starts with entangled states and resolves them as it, as it were kind of, you might say resolves them into product states and, and PBR starts with product states and resolves them into entangled states. Um, and you know, in, in Bell, you, you start things together and take them apart and in, PBR, you start things apart and bring them together, right? And the and the, the real work, you know. So they're 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 funny kind of. They're not exactly you know formally related in that way, but they're funny kind of inverse mappings between the two theorems. Okay, so 
we want to do a reductio, what's our hypothesis? Hypothesis, suppose it ever happens, it can happen that an electron, uh, that an electron prepared following the directions for an X up can be in the very same physical state as one prepared according to uh, Z up. Sorry, I said that the other way. One preparing to Z up can be in the same state as that one prepared according to the X up procedure. That's our hypothesis. We're just going to name that state S. Doesn't mean anything except a state that can both come out of my X up preparation and my Z up preparation, just as the perfect round gumball is a state that can both come out of gumball machine A and gumball machine B. Then if that, if that can happen, then obviously the Z up closet can contain some S electrons, right? Because S electrons can be prepared by that procedure. And the X up closet can also contain some S electrons that were prepared by that procedure. Uh, and it follows from that, and you know, uh, we'll talk about this a little more in a second, that if I do an experiment and I, you know, I have my assistant, I say, assistant, go grab me, grab me a pair of Z up electrons, and they go grab two boxes out of the Z up closet. They could grab two S electrons, right? Because there are S electrons sitting in that closet, and the guy's just grabbing them by whatever means he grabs them. Um, and he could grab two S's. Uh, and also, if I tell him, give me a Z up and an X up in whatever order, he could grab an S out of each closet. So I could get two S's. And if I tell him, give me two Z ups, um, two X ups, I could also get a pair of S's. Uh, so it, if I'm going to start an experiment and the and the, the thing tells me, okay, start with a pair of, X, uh, of of Z ups or start with a pair of X ups or start with a Z up and X up, under the hypothesis, it is possible that in any of those cases, I start with a pair of S electrons. And that uh, that argument, I just, I mean, I actually, you know, there is a, a step made, as Hume would say, there is a step made here which is underwritten by what we call a statistical independence assumption. And essentially all the statistical independence assumption amounts to in this case, is that if each closet contains some S electrons and you randomly by whatever method you choose, uh, 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 pick a pair of these boxes, either out of the same closet or out of different causes, you could end up with a pair of S electrons, all right? That's all that statistical independence amounts to. And, you know, if you try and think through what it would be to deny that, then I think it's, it's, it's a bit akin to, to, to maybe Despenas saying, oh, I know how to get out of Bell's result, just deny induction or something. And you say, yeah, and what's left of science at that point? Okay, um, and now again, this is written to students, so I don't, you know, I don't have the sense I'm talking down to you. It wasn't written for you. Um, now we just notice, and this is all mathematics, that even though what we're used to doing is expressing mathematically expressing entangled states as linear superpositions of product states, uh, you can do the other thing, right? You can, you can take any product state and express it in many different ways as a linear superposition of entangled states, right? There's just perfect symmetry there. Um, so, you know, normally when we write down the singlet state, which I have there, you write it as a linear superposition of a pair of product states. Um, but if you choose a basis of your spin space that's entangled states, then because it's a basis, you can write every state, including a product state, in terms of a bunch of entangled states. And so, you know, it's not something that would normally occur to you to do that, right? You're, you normally you it, it just seems much easier to express things in terms of product states as your basis, but there's nothing preventing you from choosing entangled states. Uh, and in particular, in terms of our spin, we have these four entangled, what we can call Bell states that we can use as a basis. 
So alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And again, because we're, we're talking about preparations that are either preparations of Z up or preparations of X up, uh, these are written as superpositions of product states of Z and X uh, eigenstates. And okay, so that's just four of them and they're linearly independent. And in fact, they're also orthogonal. So you've got a basis there and any state you're interested in, you can write as a linear combination of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Now, one part that gets um, you know, a, little more, a little more math here than in, in presenting, say, Bell or, or GHZ, where you really can do it with even more stripped down math, is to actually do that for these product states. Because if you do this experiment, and the experiment you say, okay, begin with a, a product state Z up, Z up, right? With two electrons in the Z up state or, or begin with the state Z up, X up. Uh, then you say, all right, well, how do I express that product state, these product states that I might start with in terms of these entangled states? And so um, if I wanna know how do I express Z up, Z up in terms of these entangled states, the natural thing to do is first of all, to rewrite the entangled states in terms of uh, product states that are all Zs, right? To get rid of the Xs in terms of Zs. And that's just a little bit of, of algebra that actually even a, a reasonably motivated philosophy major can do if they sit down and put their mind to it. Uh, and that's all I've done in this slide, right? So you don't have to do anything to alpha because it's already written in terms of Z left and Z right. And then beta, which starts out in terms of Z left and X right, you then just plug in the correct representation of the X in terms of Zs and, and you know, run out the algebra and you get the expression of beta, gamma and delta. Uh, and now everything's in terms of pure, purely in terms of uh, Z up and Z down states. And having done that, you then say, all right, in terms of now those four things, how do I do, how do I express the state where the left particle or the particle, you know, going into the left hand box of the machine or whatever is Z up and also the one going in the right hand. Uh, if you go back and look at this, it's, it's kind of nice that if you just add beta and gamma, you have these terms that cancel out, right? And so when you add beta and gamma, you just get uh, Z up, Z up, plus Z down, Z down. And then one over root two delta is one half Z up, Z up minus Z, Z down, Z down. And so it's not that hard to see that if you want the Z up, Z up state, it's one half beta plus gamma plus one over root two delta. And so, you know, it might take the students, right? They probably can't absorb that in the amount of time you say it. You know, if, they, if, they're, if they're suspicious, you know, give them 15 minutes and they can probably figure out that that's right. And then you just notice that when you express Z up, Z up in that basis, alpha doesn't come into it, right? There is no alpha component in the expression. Uh, and what that means, is, again, and this is just following the normal way we interpret the empirical significance of these things, is that if I could do an experiment where the outcomes were indexed by these four entangled bell states, that if I did the experiment on a Z up, Z up pair, I couldn't get the outcome that's associated with alpha because there is no alpha component to that thing. Right, so the, the prediction should be, you cannot get that result. Feed in Z up, Z up. Okay, so if I, if I had such a machine, if I had a machine that uh, was giving me outcomes that as it were, were associated with those four Bell, Bell basis states, it would tell me if both of the if both of the pair came out from the Z up closet, you cannot get the alpha result. 
And that's just using quantum mechanics. Again, this is just using quantum mechanics as a predictive device. It's not trying to interpret quantum mechanics at all beyond saying, if you prepare an electron in such and such a way, call it Z up. If you prepare it in such and such a way, call it X up. Um, and then if you run this experiment, you can, for example, put in a pair of Z up electrons. So you can put in a Z up X up or an X up Z up or two X ups. And, and then you're just using the normal, in the normal way, uh, the quantum formalism to predict what the outcome could be. And what it says is that formalism says, if you, if you use two boxes that came out of, out of the Z up closet, you could not get outcome associated with alpha. And then, right, then you just go through the same thing and you notice that if you express Z up X up in terms of these basis states, um, beta doesn't come into the expression. So if you started with a box from the Z up closet and a box from the X up closet, and of course the two, the ports that go into this machine have to be order, right? It's, it's, it depends on which box goes into which port. But um, so think of L and R now as, as the box that goes into the left-hand port and the box that goes into the right-hand port. Um, if you put a box from the Z up closet into the left port and a box from the X up closet into the right port, according to the theory, you cannot get the outcome associated with beta. Um, if you put X into the left port and, and, and Z up into the right port, you cannot get the result associated with gamma. And if you put in two, uh, two X up boxes, you cannot get the result associated with delta. Um, but on the other hand, you're gonna get one of those four results, right? I mean, the, the thing, the, the machine always returns a result and it always returns one of those four. Okay. And if that's true, then you get the conclusion, right? That is the Z up preparation and the X up preparation absolutely cannot possibly ever prepare physically identical states. Because if they could, then any four of these inputs, Z up, Z up, Z up, X up, X up, Z up, and X up, X up, any four of those inputs could be the pair SS. Um, but, for each of those, each of those possible inputs makes one of the four possible outcomes impossible, and then that would mean all four all four outcomes would be ruled out. But that's inconsistent because you know you're going to get some outcome or other. Um, and and so we get, reach the conclusion. Right? which is for every individual particle prepared by the X up method must be physically different from every individual particle prepared, uh, sorry, by, by the Z up method must be different from every individual particle prepared by the X up method. Assuming what? What are the assumptions that went into this thing? Well, that the predictions of quantum, the quantum recipe or quantum formalism as usually used are accurate, just like Bell. Two, the statistical independence assumption holds that, you know, if, if you've got S's in both these closets and you grab two boxes, you could grab two S's, right? That's what it amounts to. Um, and, and that's it, right? And, and therefore, in, in precisely the, the sense that you get as this conclusion, if you attribute or attach or ascribe, whatever you want to call it, a spinorial state Z up or X up to a particle via the usual techniques, right? That is, you prepared it in the normal way that, that is supposed to lead to that. That represents a real physical characteristic of some sort of the particle, right? It's not like the gumballs. Um, there really is a physical difference between any pair of particles prepared in these different ways. Um, and they are in objectively different physical states. Uh, and that rules out, right, that rules out thinking that this is like the gumball machines and that the difference between the, the collection in, in the two closets, right, the two, in the two closets, you know that statistically the collections differ quite a bit because 
you can just do lots of tests on lots of them and, and easily tell which were prepared Z up and which were prepared X up. But that didn't settle the question of whether nonetheless there could be individual particles in the two closets that are exactly alike and this settles it. Um, now, as I say, you know, you get a kind of, a, 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 as far as I can tell, a, a rather worrisome uh, analog of people who don't like this result have, have come to the point of saying, I'm just going to deny statistical independence. Um, and th there is a statistical independence assumption in Bell's. There's a statistical independence assumption here. What's normally said, and I think is correct, is that to deny that assumption is to invoke gives conspiratorial, it's not that logic forces it on you, but it, it's to invoke a kind of conspiratorial narrative, um, which would undermine doing science altogether. In, in exact, I mean, I guess in the same way, if, if I gave Bell's theorem to somebody and said, look, that proves there's non-locality. And they say, no, it doesn't prove it because you know we could all be plugged into machines like in the matrix, right? And this whole thing could be just a conspiratorial you know, fever dream. And furthermore, the, the computers and our brains, the real ones um, are perfectly local, right? And you can't actually violate Bell's inequality in the real world, but it's just violated in this fantasy world, right? Now you can say, yeah, logically that's possible, but man, if you're gonna go down that road, just give up on science, right? I mean, I, you know, you're expecting too much if you're expecting an empirical, I mean, what would you even mean by an empirical proof, an empirical refutation? Um, this, you know, it's just sort of also not a serious hypothesis. I guess I think the statistical independence assumption here is exactly the same. If there are S particles in the two, in each of the two closets, then if you get a pair of boxes, I don't care which closets you drew them from, you could get a pair of S's. That's it. Um, and, and so I don't think, right, denying that assumption because you don't like the conclusion of this argument is not, it seems to me, a rationally defensible reaction. Um, now, I guess I'm almost done. I don't know what time it is. It looks like I'm kind of all right. Um, I never used the phrase or asked a question like whether the wave function is real, right? And, and so, and, and, and you'll notice the word realism keeps cropping up here, which I also hate. I hate the word, you know, I mean, scientific realism has a perfectly good epi epistemic meaning, I understand. It, it doesn't even come in here, right? It, 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 in that sense, scientific realism has nothing to do with either Bell's theorem or this theorem. Um, to ask whether the wave function is real is just, it seems to me, kind of a category mistake, as we used to say. Uh, because the wave function is a mathematical gadget, right? It, it's, I mean, it's as real as any mathematical gadget is, and, and it gets assigned to or attributed to physical systems by, it, it, by certain rules. But what do you mean to say the mathematical thing? Is it real, right? It's a mathematical thing. It's certainly not a physical object at all. Um, and it's also, I think, not sharp enough if you say, well, what I'm really asking is, does this mathematical thing represent something physically real? Because, that, you know, in a sense, as I say here, here's a mathematical object, the average number of children in a US family. Okay, that's a perfectly good mathematical thing, right? And you could say it represents something physically real, right? Um, but it does not represent anything physically real about any particular individual family, especially if it involves fractional children, right? Um, you say you're really confused if you think that there is a, a particular family that has you know, 2.8 children. No, um, you understand, you, you can understand there, it represents a real statistical fact, um, but not a fact about individual families. And that's really our issue here, right? Um, does, if we assign different wave functions and different up to gauge equivalents, because we standardly think that different mathematically different wave functions represent the same physical state, 
uh, although we may dispute what the gauge degrees of freedom are, but that's not really our question here. Uh, if we assign different wave functions up to we, what we regard as gauge equivalents to different systems, individual systems, are they physically different? Are those two individual systems physically different from one another um, in the way that the two round gumballs that came, one came out of A and one came out of B are not physically different? And the answer is, I take it, the result of this theorem is, yes, it does, right? To that extent, if that's what you mean by is the wave function real, but I just feel like that's a, a pretty bad and potentially misleading piece of terminology that doesn't really help get at what's, what's the issue. Um, right, so the answer, so I think there was a sharp question asked, uh, and I think there is a sharp answer given. And I, I think it rules out, uh, as I understand it, it rules out cubism, right? It rules out anything you would call psi epistemicism. Um, I, you know, have the distressing impression that that's not a universally shared analysis, <laughs> um, but maybe it is. If it is, then again, I, you know, I, this is just, you know, this is the last party we're having before going on summer vacation. So just take it, take it in that spirit. And I think that's the last, yep, that's the last slide. So I'm done and right on time.